The Magnus Carlsen Chess Tour final series really cannot get any better, and whether you have been following every single recap video or if this is your first one, welcome to the show. It's 2-2 two to two between Magnus and Hikaru, it is a best of 7, and today's match, as you can see from there, the thumbnail and the title went to Armageddon, which is a slight spoiler, but the games are just so exciting. It's not a spoiler at all, Hikaru had the white pieces and started out with another Berlin defense, kind of predictable at this point. But these guys, and hopefully my recap videos, make the Berlin more exciting. Rookie 1, Knight, D6, and basically all you have to know is that this is the first theoretical break. Uh, it was actually C3, that is the overwhelming main line. Uh, Hikaru goes for Knight C3, and kind of in a funny way he goes for Knight C3, because Hikaru himself has had this with the black pieces many times. Here Magnus plays Bishop B4, looking to trade the Bishop for the Knight, uh, and Hikaru says, yes please, why not? Magnus rotates this knight back to d6 for two reasons. Number one, stop c4. Number two, put the bishop on f5. And that's exactly what he did, and just traded off a couple of pieces and stabilized his position. Hikaru got the bishop pair by playing f3. Bishop came back to g6, takes takes, and developed his light squared bishop. But now Magnus found a way here to transfer the knights to a very nice bind, knight a5. He tried to play knight c4, where they would defend each other and put some pressure on Hikaru. So Hikaru was having none of that, and just got rid of this guy, doubling these pawns, but Magnus jumps into c4, and Hikaru takes. A slow start to game one, and very quickly we got a queen endgame, where Magnus has a little bit of, a, a, a little bit of pressure, which actually be, began to become very significant. I'm fast forwarding a little bit as the player shuffled around, Magnus walked his king from g8 to b7 to potentially safeguard itself away from the queen. Now, in the endgame, when you have a queen and some pawns, or a rook and some pawns, the safety of your king and your pawn weaknesses, super important, as well as the activity of whatever piece it is that you have, whether it's a queen or a rook. And here, Magnus lashes out with f5. Hikaru's pawn weaknesses are right here, and that will become very prevalent very soon. In this position, Hikaru was playing Braveheart with his king, defending his pawns, but suddenly Magnus played this stunning move g5, which sort of comes out of nowhere. Uh, because if you take with the king, I have check, queen f5, and g6, which wins the queen. And when you take with the pawn, my queen hops in and starts to do some damage to your structure. But Hikaru here finds a very, uh, well, uh, brave idea. I don't want to say, <laughs> I don't want to say outstanding. It was actually the only thing that he could have done because otherwise he was just completely busted. Running his king to the center of the board to take the d5 pawn. Now... Beginners here would be scared of getting mated. Beginners here would be correct of being scared of getting mated. But queen f5, and now anytime you check my king, I am moving with a check. And so, after a little bit more shuffling, it was here that the players repeated moves, since Magnus is under threat of queen b6, queen b5, and queen b4. And there is nothing that you can do to force this king away. Draw greed, game one. But a pretty exciting Berlin nonetheless. In the second game, we also have e4, e5. This is where chess is a little bit more boring. Uh, we had an Italian yesterday between the players and we got 17 moves of theory. And today we have an Italian between the players. And once again, we get 17 moves of theory. This position is all theoretical, right up until this moment. Uh, last time Hikaru went for an A pawn push. Today he goes bishop g4 and lashes out with c5. Here trying to destabilize the center and activate his bishop. And he got a very promising position from the opening. Uh, bringing his rook to the c-file, bringing his rook even further up the c-file, forcing a trade here, and just playing on activity. And again, if you want to take one instructional thing away from this, is that black has a little bit better because of his uh, control of the open file, and so what he does is he trades a couple of pieces and gets it into a rook and knight versus rook and knight endgame. Now when you look at this, real quick, I guess I should also point out that's not a free pawn because of 97 checks, so little things, but... As some of you have noticed, I prefer to look at the most exciting moments of each game and maybe give you one or two bits of information uh, and summarize you up to speed. If you want me to go deep diving game by game, this is definitely not going to be the place. I would much rather do this in recap fashion, uh, and so that is why I'm doing it in this manner. You keep everything protected with f4, and when when uh, this happens with knight d6 hitting the knight and the rook, uh, the pawn and the rook, it's Hikaru playing rook c2, so he's giving away a pawn 
and counter-attacking Magnus. And when Magnus plays a4, getting his pawn out of danger, Hikaru does not respond with b6. b6 does get the pawn out of danger, but here there's a very nice way to activate this rook, which sounds kind of insane, because it can't go like this. The rook is right there. So we get b4. That is the problem. The problem is the move b3, b4, which would activate the rook whether or not black likes it, uh, get the rook into the game, and uh, for that reason, Hikaru does not play b6, but rather plays aggressive defense, which is d4. And now if you go gobbling everything, I'm going to play d3, d2, and rook c1, and actually it is black who is winning, because this is very powerful. So Magnus dials back his initiative, and the players get into a rook endgame, and very quickly agree to a draw. A lot of endgames today. Game two is a draw. We move on to game number three, another Berlin. Rapid games today weren't terribly exciting, but this one had a little bit of pressure. We have the exact same position as we had in the first game. But here, Hikaru plays bishop g5, attacking the queen on d8. Magnus blocks, Hikaru backs up to c1, because he anticipates that this capture will occur, and his bishop will come out this way, or this pawn just blocks black's development. Knight c e7, rotating and trying to play c6 and knight d6, and that's exactly what we get in the next few moves. This position did occur between Grishuk and Giri, two top 10 GMs, and now a4. So a couple of ideas, bishop a3. But watch Magnus's structure and watch how none of his pieces move, but nothing happens. So watch. Rook e8, knight f7, queen d7. So far, everything on the 7th or 8th rank. Okay, this is the first aggressive move, attacking the bishop on f4. Bishop here, oh, excuse me, rook takes, rook takes, bishop g3, and now, well, it wouldn't be a super GM game unless we saw h5, h4. Hikaru doesn't take the pawn on h5, because then you would get hit with bishop g4, takes, and you would have to repeat moves. And if you go here, your queen gets trapped. So he plays h4 himself, bishop g4, and Magnus just doesn't do anything. His pieces just kind of hang out, no weaknesses, and the players repeat, and that's that. Game number four. We get d4 from Magnus. Now, you know we have an Armageddon, so you know that this one was a draw because obviously we had to play Blitz. That is the format. Four rapid games, two Blitz, one Armageddon. But that's okay. Because this game was also pretty exciting. We got a London. Best way to play against the London, early c5. e3, queen b6, and an early c4. That's not always the best way to play against the London. And so the players get out to a queenless middle game position. And the other thing that you should know here is that white has an isolated pawn. An isolated pawn is uh, a lot better when you can push it through and surround it with pieces. It becomes a weakness the more pieces get traded, and if you can blockade the square in front of it. And so Hikaru tries to blockade the square in front of it. Now Magnus plays his best version of a delayed bond cloud, king to e2, bishop b4, and the players bring out all their pieces. Hikaru gives away the light squared bishop, as it was already a pretty passive situation anyway, and Magnus tries to instigate a little bit here with the move knight a4. This move, looking for a trade and activating the light squared bishop, takes takes, and if you play rook d8, I bring my rook to c7 and I destroy everything. And so for that reason, Hikaru lashes out with b5. It's a nice idea. It looks at first glance like you are giving away the pawn, but you're not, because that gives b7 with this pressure. And if you play a4, which is what happened in the game, we get a6. And again, you're not going to win my rooks since rook takes b2 comes with check. But Magnus saw this and basically said that his endgame here is better. Except Hikaru was on par with his defense. The question that I ask of you is, when you are under such pressure, you should look to trade off pieces. And so how does black offer a trade of pieces here? Very good. The move, knight to h5. And when you get knight to h5, you get an opposite colored bishop endgame. You should put this pawn on a5, from where it will not be captured. And then even though you lose a pawn, this opposite colored bishop endgame is a draw, since the d-pawn cannot get through the dark squared blockade. And even though Magnus does bring his king to a very aggressive square over on g6, Hikaru goes back to f8. A few more moves are made, and for the respect of both the players, I will play it out to the final position, but as long as this pawn is not getting through and black is not losing any of those pawns, we have a draw, we have a blitz game. Obviously, Hikaru with the white pieces plays e4. Obviously, Magnus with the black pieces plays the... What? The Alekine's defense? Okay.
Now it's now it's really a match. We get a four pawn attack from Hikaru. C4, D4, E5, F4. But Magnus plays this in very good fashion. He brings out the bishop to the nice square. E6 and bishop B4. And tries to chip away at the center with C5. Hikaru trades that bishop off. Castles. And brings the knight back to D2 to stabilize. It was at this point that Magnus played bishop G6. And Hikaru played queen E1 with the intention of potentially going out this way. But the queen used to cover this diagonal, and so Magnus takes advantage and plays the move knight a4. Knight a4 hits the c3 pawn and also will jump into b2 to pressure like this. And it got very bad very quickly for Hikaru. Uh, Mag uh, Magnus took the c4 pawn, and the only way that you're going to survive this with white is if you start a big kingside attack. And that's what Hikaru tried to do with the move h4. The problem is, Magnus just plays h5, and he just kicks out the queen and there's no attack at all. So you play queen g3, knight a3, and if you play bishop f6, which was a very, very nice idea from Hikaru, Magnus just wasn't having any of it. I mean, he just doesn't take. Sometimes your opponents, uh, in, in desperate measures, will go on some crazy counterattacks, and uh, bishop d3 is an idea, not quite here because f5 would block it out, but e takes f6 followed by bishop d3, but you can stop bishop d3 by playing rook c3. Keep rook c3 in mind, because it's going to happen. Bishop f6, knight c2, and we get here, and now rook c3, but still bishop takes g6 here, and this is craziness, okay? There's two bishops on your doorstep, and black has to defend himself, but it was at this point that Hikaru played rook e3, and this nice idea from Magnus now, nice idea, just stabilizing, and this is how you're going to win this game. You're not going to take the rook for free and hang checkmate in one move. You stabilize the knight, you bring the queen, you bring the bishop, and slowly but surely he chipped away at the defenses. There's a lot of moves yet to be played. I will scroll through them slowly, but Magnus did a nice job simplifying it down to a queen and five pawn versus queen and one pawn endgame, brought his pawns with his queen, gave a check, hit his king from a perpetual and got his king to safety and it was a resignation here from hikaru so magnus took a three to two lead going into the final blitz game he's got the white pieces he goes for d4 and it is hikaru nakamura in vintage style with a king's indian defense but a classical king's indian defense has e5 and hikaru didn't want to play that because then magnus would take and trade the queens so instead, what do you do when you have to win a game with the black pieces? You keep your position as closed and as many pieces on the board as you can, as possible. That's exactly what he does. c6, queen e7. Finally, Magnus goes for something on the queen side. Sacrifices a pawn for a positional bind. And with the queen on a4, you are pressuring c6, a7. But rook b4, and all of a sudden, someone is fighting here. Bishop b7 and rook f7. Very nice idea, not trading and allowing the rook in, but rather playing rook f7, attacking the queen, and stabilizing. And then it was all the Hikaru show from here. Up a pawn, rook d4, f3, nice idea here from Magnus, playing bishop f2, but Hikaru finds a nice idea himself to sacrifice the rook, activate the dark squared bishop, and have a big endgame advantage. Even though he is down a rook for a knight, these pawns are dominant, and the activity of these two pieces, with h4 locking down the pawn structure, gives him the winning chances. Get rook d1, check, some more shuffling, and there we go, Magnus Carlsen on the offensive on the queen side, and bringing in his rook, and offering a trade. Hikaru took a long think here, and transformed the position into this, where his knight and bishop absolutely dominate, but it's not so clear how he's going to break through and win this game. But he was able to do so by playing in the following fashion, allowing Magnus to create the pawn on a6, defend it with the bishop, but since he's always guarding the a7 pawn, this rook on d7 cannot take it, you cannot sacrifice because obviously I will just take, and getting it to an endgame, which after a series of big exchanges, transformed into this, and this is winning. And Hikaru, after some maneuvering, was able to get this king away from this back rank and also shielded like this. And now Magnus is out of moves in this position. Because now he's got to move his king this way. You move your rook anywhere, I just take your pawn and I win. So he brings his king and uses the principle here of the three files. 
As long as the king is three files away from the pass pawn, you will win a rook endgame. And it is cut off completely. So Hikaru marches the pawn forward and at a confident moment offers the trade of rooks. Magnus cannot accept and it doesn't matter because the king is too slow to get back. And something like this could have happened f2, f1 and both players winning with the black pieces. Vintage, Hikaru playing the king's Indian. We have Armageddon. And Armageddon, if anybody doesn't know, is how they break ties in chess. The person with the higher seating in this event chooses what color they play. Magnus chose white, which means he gets five minutes. Hikaru with the black pieces gets four minutes. There is no bonus time. However, if black draws, black wins. So you sacrifice one minute for a result. We have a d4, c4, Nimso Indian defense, one of the best defenses in chess. But Hikaru has to stabilize and play quickly, and that's what he does. We get a3 takes takes and in this position black likes to throw the pawn into the center like this and taking it is too stupid because you triple your pawns let's be serious that's not going to happen and hikaru plays in positional fashion he brings the knight back and the pressure on the center makes these bishops difficult to use since these pawns are just in the way also you're going to see bishop a6 from hikaru targeting the c4 pawn as a weakness now we got f4 from magnus trying to go f5 so we got f5 from hikaru trying to not allow f5. This transformation of the pawn structure that Magnus chose perplexed me. Uh, I, I actually told Anna Rudolph during our live coverage that I didn't like this at all. It seems like you basically wall in your bishops completely, and this is not really what you want. Hikaru's play was a little bit too easy here with moves like queen d7 and knight a5. I mean, he doesn't have to do a whole lot. And I should say that at this point, the time situation was nearing each other. Magnus had almost spent two minutes, so he had three minutes on the clock, and Hikaru had three minutes on the clock. The problem is that two results benefit one player. So once that advantage is gone, the rest of the game was relatively straightforward, uh, and it was Hikaru here who started stabilizing. Magnus kept being 20-30 seconds behind. This pawn collapsed, and Magnus tried to create counterplay on the queen side with queen b7, but Hikaru voluntarily tucked his king to h6 from where it would be shielded from the rook, and the queen is too far, and this is the only weakness that exists in the position for black. Whoop, excuse me. That would have been a very nice move, but that's not what happened. Uh, and, and you just cannot move this knight. The knight on c4 dominates. The queen protects the knight from a distance. We get queen e6 and a nice move, knight d2, looking to simplify. You cannot take this knight. I mean, you can, but queen e3 would happen. So we get rook d8, takes, takes, and check. And now rook e4. The king is completely safe from all checks. f4 is collapsing. And Hikaru transformed this with about a minute on the clock versus 30 seconds into a rook end game. We've had a lot of those today, but this one is a little bit different because it's basically winner go home for Magnus Carlsen. And by scooping up the three pawns and bringing the rook to the outside flank, it was uh, Magnus going for this rook blockade, but just count the promotion squares. Both pawns are arriving at the same time, and you're not going to win this with the white pieces. And after queen d5, block with the queen, queen d2, check the final move of the day. Queen to f4, cross-checking, and that is it. Magnus Carlsen resigned in this position to give Hikaru a 3-2 lead in the best of seven. The first Armageddon between the two of them. It took five mini-matches, but we got there. Crazy that Magnus wins with black in the first blitz game. In the second game, Hikaru wins with black in a King's Indian defense and then goes on to win the Armageddon. Let me know what, what you think was the turning point of the match. Obviously, it, it came in the Blitz. What shocked you most about Day 5? Was it that Magnus chose white in the Armageddon and didn't choose black? Was it that Magnus didn't play a bit more aggressively in the King's Indian? Let me know. Two videos are going to appear on that side. The latest upload as well as something that might get recommended for you. Listen, I truly, truly, truly appreciate all of your support. I read as many comments as I can. Uh, yesterday's video didn't have a lot of pinnable comments, honestly. So a lot of you are being very nice, very wholesome. Check out some of my tutorials on uh, openings and chess tips and rating climb, uh, tactics puzzle solving guide. And I will see you in a recap video tomorrow for day six. And if you want to catch live coverage, on Twitch, I've been streaming every day alongside Anna Rudolph on Hikaru's Twitch channel. So do say hi if you jump in, and I'll see you tomorrow.